So, in addition to what was written about Bogdan in a, in a, in announcement in description, so some very important information. Uh, uh, I I hope you will not be embarrassed, Bogdan, about uh, this part. <laughs> so no, don't embarrass me. Sorry. Don't embarrass me, please. I will tell only what you gave me about yourself, nothing nothing uh, else. So yeah, uh, Bogdan loves to play MMOR, MMORPGs, which is uh, massively multiplayer online role playing games uh, a lot. Uh, loves to play them a lot and now uh, is into Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, this game uh, is stunning with its visuals. Uh, I haven't played those, so I, I can't relate, I can't comment anything. Uh, also, Bogdan loves to enjoy taking a walk in bad weather. Mm, so, in weather like this, you don't go out, right? Or you go, but you don't enjoy. Uh, I kind of go for shopping or something, but usually yeah, I just stay home and work. Yeah, like but if it's really extremely windy or, or, or rainy, then this is for you. Rainy days are the best, actually. It's like, yeah, it's awesome. It's interesting. Can you explain why so? Is it just that you are you are a developer and you hate humans or, or what? Yeah, and, I, and I live in a cave with bats and all that stuff. No, no, no. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just like the smell of rain or something. And I, uh, same as you, I don't like when the weather is too hot or too sunny. Mm -hmm. And so the perfect for me is kind of a rainy day and the warm one. So yeah, so you can kind of enjoy the warmth and also the the picture. Okay. Okay, and uh, some more facts. Uh, so Bogdan's mostly use uh, Windows for most of personal things and enjoy it. Me too. Uh, the cloud, the apps and integration uh, by Microsoft, right? Yeah. And most of his colleagues uh, and friends are using uh, are working on Max, which leads to lots of debate about what sucks more. I think that I use Windows, and this opposite side sucks more. Uh, and uh, about Bogdan, uh, Bogdan uh, takes a bicycle almost everywhere, and disposed his car recently because of stopped using it completely. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. So now people know most important things about you and we can go further. And so you are welcome uh, to start and I will I will give you the stage. OK, OK, thank you. Um, so hello to everyone. Yeah, thank you, Edgar, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, the, most of those things were actually very, very, very true about me. And uh, yeah, two things. First of all, if you if you guys play Elder Scrolls Online as well, so make sure to find me on Twitter or on LinkedIn and we can play together. Um, yeah, I'm actually looking for uh, gaming buddies. And uh, the second one about Python, I actually, I'm not sure where the, all the hate comes from about Python, because uh, we've, we've been actually also using Python as well, and it's great for data science, it's great for actually bringing the data science to kind of uh, to the masses and building applications with the, 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 this, this code and these solutions. So for kind of, I, I think it's great, I use it. It's, it's kind of, the syntax is nice. So yeah. Um, okay, and uh, today what I wanted to talk to you about is uh, building a data pipeline on AWS. Uh, again, my name my name is Bogdans. Uh, I work at uh, Dynatech. And uh, first, kind of few facts about about me and the work we do, and kind of so, so you could get the context of why I'm actually eager to talk to you uh, to talk to you about uh, building data pipelines, uh, why specifically on AWS, and what are kind of the core things in mind uh, that I hold when uh, telling the story and the core kind of values um, that. Uh, I kind of like and kind of try to utilize uh, in uh, in the work that I do, that we do with the team. Uh, so first of all, about me, I'm an IT kind of guy. Uh, I started uh, IT in 2011, and I've been developing stuff ever since. 
Uh, first, it was kind of small stuff, websites and HTML pages, uh, the the profile kind of page and that kind of thing. And it all, it, it all <coughs> led uh, for me to being a web developer. So uh, started with the uh, kind of PHP, JavaScript and MySQL. And uh, then I kind of t went kind of to a turning point <coughs> and uh, started getting more into database stuff. Uh, database development, uh, database specifics, different nuances there, and it can kind of all switch to a data warehouse work, uh, where we started to actually <coughs> uh, do the analytics stuff and all the kind of cool, big, small, and medium data stuff. Uh, and uh, now I'm a member of a BI and data services department at Dynatech. Uh, we actually do what the the <coughs> the team title kind of says. We do BI and data services, and data pay pipeline is of course one of those of those things that I'm kind of involved in. And actually, that's one of the reasons uh, uh, why this talk and why this topic. And so we at Dynatech uh, actually are kind of a uh, big. Uh, uh, amount of people. Uh, we do different stuff, different IT stuff mostly. Uh, so from the CRM systems, uh, voice over IP solutions, uh, different uh, different development supports, uh, things for our customers. And one of those thing, one of those things is uh, being involved heavily in cloud platform development. So developing in the cloud and uh, doing a lot of different things in the cloud. And the second one, important for me specifically, is uh, doing business analytics and data analysis, uh, business intelligence and, and, and all that. So, and uh, this kind of grew into the company, uh, the cloud and analytics, and it kind of evolved quite a bit. And uh, with, the, with the company growing in the past uh, in recent years, uh, the work that we do actually also involved and uh, rooted into the, the cloud ecosystem, uh, specifically AWS. And uh, so this talk, actually, I, I will have only one kind of quote in this talk. I'm not going to bore you with uh, quotes different different people said. Um, this is like the, the one and only thought that I today deem very kind of exciting and uh, very valuable is that 90% of the data you collect will never be actionable or even helpful. And uh, that is kind of the sad truth nowadays. This quote is actually quite old, but it, it was true then, in my opinion, it's true now. Uh, because most of the data that you have, the, mo the most of the data you collect, and uh, most of the data you transfer uh, to your analytic systems, if you have those systems, uh, isn't actually used that much. And uh, like there, are, uh, there is a bunch of data that's very critical for the business uh, and the application to kind of uh, to, to be to be used and uh, those are usually critical things like ex expenses and profits right and the rest of it kind of lays there somewhere it is just there and somebody maybe sometimes watches the data but it's not that important and uh, kind of this is like this is a huge problem and uh, this is kind of the problem uh, we pivot around and try to work around and try to solve uh, at Dynatech. Uh, so uh, with the BI and with data services, like the core idea that, that we have and uh, what we try to uh, bring to the customers is uh, having the data available. Uh, I know like kind of in some companies, uh, data isn't the core value. It's not the main thing that drives decisions. Uh, in my opinion, it's kind of wrong and it shouldn't be like that. And uh, so having the data available for your customers, for business users, for operation, uh, operations users, for sales is kind of vital in my opinion. And uh, this value is uh, kind of very important to be uh, always uh, uh, for, for people to be informed about things. And so the second one is visibility of the processes. So every business, especially huge ones are kind of uh, 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 we, they, they kind of are just a lot of processes grow around those businesses, right? And uh, the, the older the business, the more things are happening there. And with data, you can kind of can dig into it and uh, find out things that are actually happening through the data. 
and you can actually well get more involved with the with the processes and of course uh, the main thing kind of we strive for is high speed in, uh, of investigations and feedback loop so when you have a question about anything that is happening in the company we try to kind of dig into data try to see what's happening there and the, the the faster the data is available and the easier it is to access the data uh, access the data uh you kind of the faster you can do your investigation and the faster you can give feedback for the process or the things that are happening and the faster you can actually react to those so those are kind of the main things the motivation for having the behind data services right and this kind of mindset isn't unfortunately uh a typical one um, and uh, this, uh, this is just uh, the that's just from what I've kind of seen in in, in practice. Uh, and uh, you need to, of course, strive there for those values. And uh, with this comes kind of uh, technical uh, technical uh, technical part of the of the process. And uh, of course, what we can, uh, again, from the technical perspective, what we try to uh, build in, in, in Dynatech is, of course, first of all, self-service and uh, ownership of the data. So we try to kind of uh, learn, again, with the customers to own the data, to find things about the data and to kind of understand the data together so that everyone's on the same page. Uh, we try to make it scalable and we tr we try to uh, build the collaborative uh, kind of teams and to empower people to col collaborate more and share their findings, share their analysis. And uh, again, this actually goes very well with the with the cloud services and uh, the cloud, uh, both technologies and uh, the, the cloud products uh, that are there in the world uh, with AWS, with Azure, with the Google, uh, because those actually empower people to collaborate more and share information. And I think that's cool. Um, and of course today, the data pipeline, what it is, what it isn't, and uh, why you kind of should, should build one. Uh, first of all, like to get it out of the way, the data pipeline is a process of moving data from one system to another. And that's kind of it. So this definition actually describes the data pipeline uh, process very accurately, and there indeed is nothing to it. Um, so let's say, for example, you have a database and uh, you need to analyze the data. And if you really need to analyze it and you don't kind of want to uh, cause problems for the, for the application that's using the data, you of course can take the data, move it somewhere else and kind of start using it and analyzing it. Uh, for example, take uh, results of, a, of uh, COVID data collection, like a summary, and kind of try write a Python script, Python script to analyze it. It's actually an excellent um, example. And uh, the data pip pipeline is actually the process of moving that data from the uh, original data source to your kind of environment for you, where you do your research. And uh, it can be many things. So like the simplest uh, examples that, that come to mind is just, uh, for example, writing a cron job, which just connects to an operational database, uh, dumps some data and moves them to another database or saves them as a CSV file, right? Um, so another example, which is also very popular is creating a kind of a database a replication uh, to move the data from the operational uh, data storage to an analytical data storage and it's also very popular uh, right and uh, maybe you are more advanced in your company is big and uh, actually uses the data actively so then to move the data you might use something like uh, RabbitMQ uh, or some kind of other message broker which would help you uh, to Kind of collect the data from maybe multiple sources and move the, uh, the data in messages to your destination data storage and uh, kind of this scheme actually shows a very kind of simple example of how it works so there's an application you take the data from the application you move the data to the data storage and then the data users uh, either business or researchers 
can actually access the data and kind of utilize utilize your data storage, whether it's database or some file system or whatever, right? And the data pipeline is uh, that thing in the middle, in the middle. So the delivery of the data to the data storage and partially the data storage itself. And uh, yeah, it's uh, that simple and uh, there's actually nothing to it. And uh, the reason for building a data pipeline prim primarily is because uh, your environment where you kind of exist and develop all those things and work with data uh, is growing or intends to grow. Because uh, those kind of s more simple cases that I've uh, mentioned, uh, those are like very simplistic processes that you can set up in a day and uh, for, for the most part, right? And uh, you kind of you get to the days right away and there's there aren't any problems. Problems arise when you are Either your data vol volumes grow or the amount of data sources, meaning applications grows and kind of the more complexity there is to the data sources and to the data and to the things that you need to do with the data, uh, the more complex your data pipeline kind of uh, becomes. And uh, with, with that complexity, Basically, kind of the first step when you're developing data pipeline is uh, a, uh, incorporating a message broker as an uh, input for your data into data pipeline, like uh, an entering uh, place. Uh, and so usually, uh, this is there. There are kind of ready solutions for that. Of course, there are a lot of them. First of all, and the most uh, popular one is Kafka. And uh, with with that, okay, there's RabbitMQ. There are you can write I don't know a Ruby or Python application that kind of brokers your messages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the initial idea about the message broker is that uh, uh, this message broker he he helps you to decouple your data storage, the the place where you kind of store and analyze your data, from the application from the applications themselves. Uh, this is very crucial, uh, specifically because uh, usually the way it goes is that uh, the applications are developed for, by one teams, uh, by one team or set of teams, and the data storage and analytics part is developed by another, by other people, right? And uh, the thing is, when the application kind of puts the data right into the data storage, uh, this means that. Uh, you as as an owner of the data storage can lose control of how the data uh, is delivered to your data storage and that can cause problems like for example if if we let's say have a data storage of a simple mysql database maybe it's huge maybe it's not and we have let's say 100 applications which kind of uh, just take their data and put it directly into mysql storage with a direct connection uh, then you kind of lose control, especially if it's 100 applications with, let's say, 10 different teams. Uh, you lose control of how the data is delivered to the data storage and you can run out of connections. You can have different optimizations problems and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the message broker, broker kind of solves that problem. So if you uh, try and put the message broker between the applications and the data storage, then first of all, applications uh, get a very simplistic interface to put the data into some kind of pipeline right um, and for the most part mostly the message broker implements a very simplistic interface to get the data to kind of to save the data into the pipeline uh, and then you can utilize kind of the custom configurations and connections etc cetera, etc cetera, already in the data pipeline application to effectively uh, store your data into the data storage and that that that's kind of the the idea of a message broker and why why it is there. And uh, as I've mentioned, there are multiple there are tons of different message brokers that you can utilize. Uh, what uh, we've come up with as a viable solutions kind of for our problems and what I've seen in practice is great to use. Uh, uh, is basically those two: Amazon Kinesis Data Streams and Amazon Simple uh, Q Service. And uh, this the kind of the benefits of using one of these two solutions is mostly because they scale almost infinitely, especially simple queue service, especially if you pay per request or for the data transfer. Uh, 
Uh, so it doesn't really ma matter if you have, I don't know, a gigabyte of data per day or 10 or, or 1000 gigabytes of data per day. Amazon Simple Queue service kind of can handle that, of course, with different types of problems. Uh, but yeah, uh, Amazon Kinesis data streams. Uh, for, for those of you who haven't uh, heard the uh, the about the service or how it works. It's very simple. It's very similar to how Kafka works. Actually, it might be very well Kafka as a service or something, uh, right? So the idea is that you can create a stream and you can put the data into the stream and uh, you can kind of read the data from stream uh, from the stream. And uh, the idea is again that the stream has uh, multiple shards and those shards have a very fixed and defined throughput. Uh, which varies by region. And uh, uh, you can actually kind of uh, calculate how much data will be coming through a stream, and uh, you can place the the appropriate amount of shards, kind of you can fix the through output of your stream, and you can well transfer the, da the data. Uh, the best part about Amazon Kinesis isn't that it can, can transfer data and it streams, at its, uh, it has streams at its scales. The best part is actually that uh, there is a f an additional service which com comes kind of with uh, Amazon Kinesis, which is called Firehose, uh, which can kind of provide the, uh, the functionality for reading from the stream. So with that service, you kind of get the message broker, which can collect data and kind of transfer the data further. And you can, can get also a quite reliable buffering mechanism, which can, can collect the data into buffer, store it into files, maybe put it somewhere in the database, or maybe connect another service and try to analyze it in real time, right? Uh, so that's kind of, yeah, a, a big and mo most of the time very convenient thing. And Amazon Simple Queue service is, uh, well, what it says, it's a simple queue service, so you can collect your events or records, you can store them in, into a simple queue, and then you can consume that queue by some process and <clears throat> And you can then do with do anything you want with that data. And of course, the only downside of the Amazon Simple Queue service is that uh, it needs kind of a consumer. So with the Amazon uh, Kinesis, the consumers are kind of built in and they already exist. And you just can pick whatever you like, whatever is available, and you, you can build for further your data pipeline with it. With Amazon uh, Simple Queue service, you actually need to create a consumer and uh, most of the time that kind of the best solution is uh, utilizing the AWS lambdas for that. And I will talk about it a little bit later. <clears throat> so especially with Kinesis, the best part that you can do, not only collect the data from different uh, applications, but also you can do a fan out of your uh, data. Uh, you can deliver the same data into multiple databases. You can actually filter some of these streams that you produce. And uh, yeah, so the idea is that you, the application sends a message into your message broker and you can actually take that message and clone it and use the same message in, in, in multiple and in, in multiple kind of processes. So for example, if I, if I would want to have a database uh, where my users mostly would go and analyze my data, I would take a message broker, I would connect it to a database, and I would just put the, the records there in the appropriate tables, right? And uh, if I would like to, let's say in this main database, I would like to hold on the, the fraction of the data, let's say the last six months or, or so, because let's say I have a lot of data, right? Um, the a good thing would be not to discard the data right away, but maybe to have kind of a cold storage copy, where, uh, sorry, a cold storage copy, where you could kind of put the data and maybe read the data later and kind of see the historical uh, maybe reports or just access historical records. And uh, usually there are kind of two ways to go about it. Uh, the, the first one, which usually is done, and usually uh, especially Elasticsearch does that very well, uh, is that you you have a hot storage and you have a cold, cold storage and you just take the data from the hot storage and you transfer it and kind of copy it to the cold storage and you pay for the cold storage kind of slow, uh, big chunk of data 
you pay for it less, but there is a lot, lots of lots of data, right? And with the message broker, you can kind of uh, utilize a little bit different but pattern. You can take the same data from the stream and you can just uh, duplicate it into your main hot dat database where you hold all the re relevant and up-to-date data. And you can also take that and well be with l less frequently, you can put it into your kind of, uh, maybe maybe it's data lake, maybe it's a no SQL database or whatever. Maybe it's just an object oriented storage and you can put that copy of the data of the same data from the same stream there. And the beauty of the, this thing that from the, your kind of main database, you can just delete the data and simply because this data is already copied and already exists in kind of the, the, an alternative storage. And here in the, in, the, in the example, there are only two databases, but actually there can be three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> And there are a lot of options you can choose from to actually store your data, and that's the beauty of the pipeline and the message brokers. So you can put your data, the most kind of common solution for uh, bigger uh, analytic uh, environments uh, would be an, an analytical database uh, on Amazon. You can uh, put, uh, you can spin up a Preston in EMR. You can use Amazon Redshift, it's, which is an analytical scalable petabyte database. And there are lots of options for NoSQL databases, MongoDB, Elasticsearch. You can use, of course, transactional databases, MySQL, PostgreSQL, uh, Windows database, and Oracle databases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and kind of the best part, which is uh, <coughs> the document storage, uh, which is a AWS S3 service, where you can just put plainly objects into into kind of document storage and object storage. You can put the data there and kind of forget forget about it. And after some time, you just can connect some kind of SQL engine, for example, AWS Athena, or maybe Hive, or maybe Spark, or whatever. And you can kind of read the data and utilize the, 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 the value, can get the value of the data. Um, again, coming to the previous uh, image, the previous kind of pat pattern and architecture, <clears throat> if you do that directly from message broker to different databases, there, of course, tend to be different problems. And the most common one, especially with the AWS services, is that not every database behaves and uh, the same way when you import the data. And so there are different specifics in how you import the data and what data you can import and can't import and uh, <coughs> how the kind of the import process work. For example, for transactional databases, you actually create a transaction. You kind of put, let's say, 500 records into the transaction. You commit the transaction and the records are there, right? For analytical database, specifically, let's say for Redshift, uh, you can't do that. Well, of course you can, can write an insert, but it will be very slow. It, it won't be very efficient and it would uh, actually do more harm than good. And uh, can, for Redshift, let's say the best uh, way to actually import the data would be to collect uh, as much data as you can into a buffer and put 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 the chunk of data into a um, S3 as a file or as multiple files and kind, of, and kind of tell Redshift to import the data from the S3 bucket prefix or whatever. For NoSQL databases, usually, uh, as far as I remember, especially with, with Elasticsearch, you have a kind, kind of IPI which as, as well uh, kind of expects you to collect the data, maybe more more than one, more than ten records, right? To get get the chunk of data and kind of put it in one request. <clears throat> and usually, the the larger the amounts of data uh, the database can process and analyze, <clears throat> the bigger chunks you need for it to work effectively. <clears throat> and. Uh, here comes this third part of the data pipeline, but which usually is there, is the processing part. <clears throat> I call it processing, but actually it's kind of the taking the data, filtering the one you need, adapting the format, and well, importing the data into the database, into destination storage, I would say. And uh, the processing again can be done with different uh, kind of uh, tools and things. And the idea is that you actually need some kind of script or some utility to take the data that comes from the stream, either it's in buffer or is, is it a live stream, and you need to take the data, you need to actually adjust the format and adjust kind of maybe 
take more data or generate some SQL query uh, to put the data into the storage. And uh, the idea is that for each database, the approach of how you actually get the data into the database or the storage uh, is very different. And uh, again, this also goes well with the, with the kind of the idea of br message broker and kind of cloning the streams and getting two, three, four streams uh, of your data to kind of utilize this uh, different processing and different things that happen actually happen with the data. And uh, of course, uh, AWS Kinesis and uh, the Firehose, they kind of have some destinations built in. Right, so if you're on Amazon, if you're in the analytics and you, of course, have heard of Amazon Redshift, which is uh, their analytical database, there's, of course, Amazon Elasticsearch service, which as, as well works well with uh, AWS Kinesis. And there are some, some other options, but actually on this screen, this is kind of it. And uh, with SQS as an alternative, the uh, the list is in kind of shorter, right? Because uh, SQS don't even have this additional functionality to import the data somewhere. You need to consume the messages. And uh, yeah, so here are just a few options. Amazon Redshift, Elasticsearch, S3, Splunk. And uh, well, yeah. And from those destinations, you can kind of take the data and put it somewhere f further, kind of utilize it further. Uh, what we thought about quite a lot of how how you you can build a data pipeline and how you can make it actually uh, more kind of versatile and give more possibility to the data pipeline developer of, of, of what uh, the developer can do with the data and where the data can go. Uh, we've kind of uh, come to the solution of using a lam lambda functions and. Uh, Surprisingly, there are a lot of things that you can actually do with Lambda functions and with the serverless way of processing the data, right? Um, here are the three things you can do with Lambda functions, kind of how you can invoke Lambda functions. And the first one is a synchronous push. So there's an Amazon AP get, uh, gateway. So basically you can create a REST API and at the end of it as backend, you can connect the Lambda function or multiple functions which would be triggered when somebody opens a link or calls the API. Um, the second one is uh, asynchronous events, and those come with Amazon SNS and those come with Amazon S3. Uh, so basically, it, um, Amazon SNS isn't quite important to our topic because Amazon SNS kind of is uh, built for a little bit different usage pattern, but pattern, but Amazon S3 is actually perfect because we, if we come to the previous slide, sp specifically Amazon Kinesis worked with Amazon S3 quite well. Uh, so if your let's say if your data, data storage is maybe a Hadoop cluster, or maybe your data storage is a simple MySQL database, or you're using Pintaho, Pintaho or maybe something else, uh, then of course the best way uh, from from this and kind of the cheapest way from this list would be using Amazon S3 and kind of connecting Amazon with uh, S3 with the Lambda functionality. And so the idea is very simple. Amazon S3, when you do something with an object on Amazon S3, for example, Amazon Kinesis created this beautiful chunk of data and you have, kind of, let's say, 15 megabytes of different events put into a file and it it, 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 it resides on Amazon S3 somewhere in the bucket. Uh, uh, bucket. And uh, what you can do is you can actually say, okay, um, we created this file, this file is ready uh, and you can actually use it, you can utilize it. And uh, what you can do is you can create an asynchronous event which would call, uh, which would trigger a Lambda function and that Lambda function would uh, would be able to do something with that file. So specifically, you have a message broker which can buffer files, which can put those files on an S3 storage. And uh, later on, you can uh, trigger <coughs> specific events uh, and trigger Lambda functions to do something with that data. And again, if you have, let's say, my SQL database, basically your Lambda function can just take the data, uh, create SQL statements, SQL insert statements uh, from the data and 
put it into a database. If you have different database, then of course the, the, part, the usage part, pattern would be different, right? And uh, the last one, if you, for example, need a, a real-time analytics, a real-time data pipeline, real-time real uh, kind of data collection and delivery <clears throat> service, you can put the Lambda function directly into Amazon Kinesis, and you can read not a chunk of data, which is buffered and ready for, uh, for use, you can actually read the live stream of data right away. Uh, we kind of, uh, we kind of, tried Lambda function and loved it very much. Uh, I I personally love Lambda functions very much, specifically for the part where the Lambda function is a serverless, um, a serverless tool. So when you're doing the same kind of thing with kind of the standard or the traditional approach, you actually, you create, let's say, EC2 instances, a fleet of them, and those EC2 instances, they connect to a message broker, or they there are some scripts which uh, kind of uh, import the data in a different way, and then you have to manage all those instances, and then you have to manage all those processes on those instances, and then you have to monitor the memory, uh, the CPU usage patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when things go south, you need to kind of uh, go through the EC2 instance logs and figure out what's happening, why it is happening, and what's the problem. Right? With Lambda functions, you don't have that. Uh, this fleet is kind of hidden from you, and all you have is an asynchronous or maybe poll-based stream event or maybe synchronous push event, and all you have to do the functionality you need for your, in our case, data pipeline, and this is beautiful. Um, so in this specific case of our, our average and abstract data pipeline, you have a message broker, you <coughs> You get the data from the message broker to an S3 bucket. You take the data eventually and uh, deliver it into a specific uh, Lambda function. And this Lambda function can do stuff with this data. And most of the time, it can just take the data and put it into a database. And here you go. Here you go. It's, it's a very simple. It's uh, as essentially serverless data pipeline on AWS that you can use and uh, utilize for your use cases and be happy with it. Uh, thank you very much, that's the end. Uh, but it's not, and uh, there's more to it. Uh, because, well, when you have kind of an S3 bucket, you have a notifi notification system and you have a Lambda pro processing function and your data comes in a unified format uh, in a controlled way from a message broker, you can do stuff with these tools, right? And you can kind of do crazy stuff with these tools. <clears throat> so essentially, you can, for example, create a more complex ETL process with this data pipeline. You can uh, create several, you, for example, you can have an S3 bucket. You can create several prefixes, let's say step one, step two, step three, or prefix one, two, three, or whatever. And you can have multiple Lambda functions which kind of take the data, transform it in some way, process it, maybe clean it, and put it into another prefix. And then another prefix kind of triggers an, a notification to a second Lambda function, which kind of takes, uh, again, is uh, invoked, takes the data, a specific file, a chunk of data, and process it, uh, processes this uh, file in a very specific way, right? And then you can put the result somewhere, either it's in the next prefix, and you can kind of iterate that and you can build actually a huge, a lot of steps with this with this approach. And, uh, or maybe this Lambda function just take, takes the data and puts it essentially into a database uh, where the users could can read the data, right? And again, uh, this, this is uh, beautiful in a way that it gives you a lot of flexibility in what you can do and uh, what you can actually achieve with that. So if you want MapReduce, you can do that. If you want maybe merge the data, maybe you want uh, uh, some kind of fun in or fun out of your data, you can do it. If you want maybe to filter out the data in some, part uh, some particular way on or maybe at some particular steps, you can actually do that with your Lambda functions. And the beautiful part is that your Lambda functions don't necessarily need to be written in Python, right? So you can use Node.js, uh, you can use, uh, to my knowledge, you can use Node.js, uh, okay, Python, PHP, and 
something else. So there is kind of deep reset uh, set of languages that's actually built in into Lambda function. And of course, uh, you can actually build your own uh, kind of, if I remember correctly, it was a Docker image or something. So you can build your image of the compiler and you can actually expand those list of languages and you can build, build your Lambda function in, in R or in Go or maybe in F sharp or whatever language you, you like, uh, which is again, very cool. Uh, uh, this actually also from practical experience, it also makes developers really happy because they can really write the data processing and data delivery in the language that they like. So if you have a Python expert in your team, in your team and a Node.js expert in your team, you can actually take those and give them this, this tool set and they can do stuff with it without having a lot of, a lot of arguments about the, the, the languages, right? Uh, of course, Lambda functions and serverless comes with its limitations and uh, Luckily for Lambda functions, those limitations are kind of well described, well written, and well set. Um, those are the kind of precise numbers that you can go uh, over. Uh, again, luckily those numbers kind of change from time to time, and uh, even a half a year ago those numbers were smaller. Now they're bigger, and the concurrent executions for Lambda functions are set to a hard 1,000 limit. There's a limit on memory allocation, so your Lambda cannot allocate more than uh, specified amount of memory. Uh, there is a specific timeout maximum for your Lambda function. So uh, a single invocation of your Lambda cannot work more than 15 minutes. And you have a limit on deployment package and temporary directory storage. And that's kind of it. Those are all the limitations. So it's not uh, the, the this tool set of uh, using a stream bucket and message broker and your database and Lambda functions isn't the universal. So we, you can do anything with it, the way you can do do things with an EC2 instance fleet, uh, but you can do quite a lot pretty easily with pretty much uh, pretty pretty little effort and pretty pretty much results, and it gives you kind of this empowering feeling that you can actually build a data pipeline and own it and uh, and write stuff in it and process the data and deliver in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, of course. The main problem that you will have uh, going this way, if you ever choose to uh, build a simple data pipeline on the AWS, is that uh, your database actually has limits. Most of the data storages, uh, most of the data storages have limits, and unless your database or your data storage isn't built for, well, it isn't cloud native and isn't infinitely scalable, you will run into problems with your database. Uh, the, the best way about a data pipeline is that you will be able to acknowledge those problems and you will be able to solve those problems because you in a data pipeline with the message broker and uh, specific ways of how you import the data have control over what and how you put into your database. And uh, the most common problems, especially with analytical services and uh, analytical databases, uh, I mean, and NoSQL databases, is that the amount of uh, insert queries that you actually can do uh, efficiently is kind of limited. Of course, it depends on your setup, it depends on your, on your servers, it depends on your cluster or whatever you have, uh, but usually kind of uh, you can't, with an analytical databases, you can write, uh, let's say 10,000 inserts per second and kind of live with that easily because this analytical database isn't well built for that kind of workload, right? Because that's mostly a transactional workload. And so if you're using a transactional database, let's say MySQL, you of course can do that and it will work because the transactional database can be built for this this stuff again depends on the data volumes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for an analytical database, it, it isn't the best way to do things, and so you need some kind of concurrency control. Uh, and uh, the problem with the S3 notifications, as they are currently in 2020, and uh, essentially with message brokers as well, and uh, with SQS. Um, uh, SQS service as well is that the concurrency con control is somewhat limited there. And if you just scale infinitely, then you will just put your database out 
because you will have too, uh, too many in invocations, too many imports coming in. And so essentially, that plays kind of this last uh, part of your data pipeline when where you take your data and you put it into database you need to control more thoroughly and uh, to, to to kind of make the database work okay right and with s3 that's kind of not very possible uh, because the events are asynchronous so as soon as the file is created on uh, as soon as an object is put in, onto an S3 bucket and then the notification is kind of uh, fired right away and it happens asynchronously so for example if I create a script which can import the data and import a lot of data or maybe I have some spike on my website and a lot of data suddenly starts coming in uh, I can go from five uh, import invocations a minute to a thousand one or maybe ten thousand one, and it kind of it, it does scale, and uh, I unfortunately have seen it uh, in uh, practice how it scales and how it kind of ruins your database if your database isn't kind of built for uh, actually really fast scaling depending on the load. And uh, currently, again, the best solutions kind of utilize the uh, some kind of queue service uh, to have more. Uh, to have more uh, control over how you invoke your data imports, how many are happening at, at the time and uh, kind of queue them in a way, because if your data pipeline is uh, overwhelmed with data and incoming and you don't have this kind of some kind of queuing for your database to be able to to process all the data in a timely manner uh, then if you just put all the data and take all the data and put it into the database then the database breaks and uh, the idea is pretty simple that uh, eventually in the last step you put your data that you want to import with a lambda function onto an s3 bucket but you don't necessarily import the data right away you send a specific notification into uh, some kind of queue service and uh, this queue service um, in, in turn co calls the lambda function and that lambda function has a message that okay i now i need to import this file you take this file and import it so can it's it's a workaround around it's a workaround um, for the s3 asynchronous model so you can kind of synchronize all the import by using additional aws services and kind of have control over it. <clears throat> and of course, the simple queue service is kind of the best fit for this. For this approach, first of all, it provides you with natural uh, throttling. <clears throat> so with the three notifications, all, all of your events are fired right away. Uh, with simple queue service, it works kind of in a different way. You put the data into the simple queue service and uh, the speed at, at which you consume the messages actually depends on how many messages you consume from the simple queue service. So for example, if you have uh, if you have five messages per minute, then your Lambda invocation, which is which can be connected to, to an uh, SQS, <coughs> will be moderate. It will just fire eventually at some at some point pr pretty soon, but not right away maybe. <coughs> On the other hand, if, if you have tens of thousands of messages, uh, in your simple queue service, then first it will go slow, then uh, the system will kind of notice that you have a lot of messages and Lambda function is consuming your messages. So the simple queue service kind of naturally will scale their resources and with that will scale your Lambda function invocations, which is cool. So basically, if you have a spike and in data imports or even just naturally, your data import is kind of spiky. So let's say you have a minute time interval and in the first five seconds comes 90% of your one in minute interval data. Uh, so with uh, with the direct import from the S3 with notifications, you would have kind of spiky loads in your database. You will have the same spiky invocations, uh, invocation part pattern in your Lambda function statistics. <clears throat> but if you utilize the SQS, uh, this kind of will throttle and the statistics and the charts will even out and the import will will be more even as well. So this will kind of even 
your load, your import, import load on the database or data storage. And of course, there are options. So with the simple queue service, you can actually make some in, uh, invocations. You can import some data asynchronously. You can import some of the data synchronously as it comes. Though you should be able also, if, if you choose to import your data synchronously, you should be aware of that most message brokers actually uh, use the asynchronous pa pattern. So kind of if you need to import your data synchronously, then you maybe need to an additional synchronous data broker for that. <clears throat> of course, with the SQS services, it's actually quite an old service in AWS. It has a lot of different built-in features. For example, registry policy, uh, which you actually can control. You can say, okay, if my Lambda function or import fails, if the database isn't available, I can actually take, uh, try again in five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, of course, the best part, which I love the most, is error handling uh, on the part of uh, Lambda functions. Uh, this is kind of the concept of building things for failure, and uh, it's it's really cool in a way that uh, kind of if you've uh, if you've received some data and your Lambda function cannot actually process it and put it into a database, then the simple queue service actually can handle the failure eventually after your rate uh, retry uh, policies run out. You can uh, take the error file or message which you couldn't import and you can do something with it, maybe put it into another storage or maybe notify some somebody or maybe send that file via email or whatever you choose to do, right? So this is kind of cool and it's always good to have this fallback that you can use and utilize uh, to kind of build more resilient uh, data pipeline. <clears throat> another thing that you should be aware of is concurrency with the uh, Kinesis Firehose. Uh, this is a pro it's it's not a problem it's a behavioral pattern that's not uh, uh it's not kind of it, it well it is in documentation but you can't see it right away and uh, can't think of things that might go wrong with it so the idea is that you have a stream or maybe multiple streams and you have a shard or maybe multiple shards and uh you kind of you take the data in through that kinesis through that message broker and that message broker kind of uh, with the fire hose you can create buffered files of those messages so the idea is that you your applications kind of put the data into kinesis and uh, essentially for example let's say once a minute you get a s3 object out of it right and uh, what it doesn't say well doesn't point point out specifically and vividly is that you actually get a file for each uh, shard that you have in a stream. So for example, if you have one stream and you have 10 shards, then at the end of, let's say, your specified interval, let's say one minute, uh, you will get a buffer for each of the shards. And kind of, if you think about how it works and, and the, the, asynchron the asynchronous pattern and the buffering, it kind of makes sense because it should work that, like that, but it's not, uh, you kind of you don't get that right away from how the service is built. And what you can end up with is that you have a pipeline. It works just fine and it has kind of uh, understandable concurrency uh, patterns. The statistics is cool. The, uh, cool. the database is handling things. Everything is fine. And at some point uh, you get a lot of data in, but not uh, like a, in, in a spiky pattern but let's say you run a new service you create a new product and you kind of connected your data pipeline to this new thing and you have just a lot of data now and from 10 shards you go to 100 shards to 200 shards and essentially uh, with the growth of number of shards you get more concurrency right away so instead of getting 10 files uh, once a minute you will be you will be getting to a uh, well, to 2,000 files once a minute, right? And these concurrency levels are kind of different. So you would need to adjust your pipeline accordingly. And again, this is one of the one of the reasons why you need some kind of concurrency control at the end, not to overwhelm your database and be in control of, of your data pipeline. And uh, this is the big message, message from today, designed for failure. And this is kind of the... Well, this is the prayer and the preach that I do preach for people. Uh, if you're trying to build some something either for AWS or some kind of or other cloud 
or maybe you're doing things on premise, designed for things to fail. That's kind of very important. And uh, yeah, with that pat pattern, with that, that design in mind, with that idea in mind, uh, you will know when, when something fails, because everything eventually fails, you will know where to look and what to do. And yeah, it, it will just be easier for, for you to handle that failure when you expect it. And what we've done with failure patterns and how we managed to design for failure uh, our data pipelines in Dynatech is that we essentially uh, utilized CloudWatch quite effectively. Um, again, when you're designing a traditional pipeline, you have a Kafka or maybe you're already using Kinesis and uh, you have a fleet of EC2 instances or maybe some kind of, I don't know, different Kubernetes cluster or something else then uh, you as, uh, eventually you come to the problem that you need to collect logs and metrics from this uh, uh, from this basically infrastructure of a data pipeline and you need to somehow process it uh, processes those logs and those uh, well collect those metrics create those metrics etc cetera, etc cetera, right and only when you have logs and metrics you can actually understand what is happening in your data pipeline and you can well search for failures and fix them before it breaks something in your reports or analysis. Uh, with, with the serverless approach and with AWS, with lambdas and S3 files, you don't actually have that traditional infrastructure. You don't put uh, log collection agents on your machines because you don't have machines at all. And so with, with, the, with this data pipeline pattern and with, with these tools, you can actually finally well look into cloudwatch and try to utilize what the cloudwatch has to offer and what the cloudwatch has to offer is actually quite a lot um, the first one is metrics so the best part is that you can actually create metrics in cloudwatch from your lambda functions so essentially when you import the data you can write about it in in cloudwatch metrics and later look at the, the charts and see how much data you imported and why you can create uh, log groups and uh, draw insights from the logs actually each lambda function by design writes logs and essentially in your data pipeline and data processing you can uh, just write to the std out and get your logs right away in cloudwatch you can create log filters so you can filter and look for specific things in your logs with that with these free tools you can actually create dashboards and create alarms uh, in order for you to get visibility of what is happening and uh, see well alarm you in case of failure that's kind of like the basic thing and here are a few tips uh, a very simplistic one of your can, what you can do with cloudwatch and how you should maybe do it because it's kind of the easiest way and this is how amazon uh, does it for the most part is uh, first of all create a common namespace for your custom metrics create a single namespace if right right metric there uh, this way, you, when you open the CloudWatch, you will have everything about your data pipeline and the single namespace in kind of by one place. And well, you would enjoy it more. Uh, again, for, for your CloudWatch metrics, collect high level, uh, high level metrics only. So if you, for example, have th three, uh, 3, 000, 300 or maybe 3,000 different events, and uh, so basically you have 3,000 3, different tables or destinations, in your data storage and you want to collect metrics about each of them don't do it with cloudwatch metrics because this is kind of this the this is a lot of different metrics and you will just get lost in them this is just the way things work so collect only high level metrics which you can can reason about and so that with metrics you can investigate kind of on a high level what is happening and if something happening uh, something bad is happening on a high level you can react to it and the second part, if you do indeed need all the details about your imports and what is happening, you can write uh, event logs uh, from your Lambda functions. Uh, what I mean by event logs is basically a JSON object with different properties uh, because CloudWatch and Log Insights actually provide you the tooling you need to query the event logs query the logs, search by the properties, filter by the properties, and do basic aggregations with it. So essentially, if you write a lot of logs and, the lo and those logs are structured as events, as objects, you can essentially 
search through them and get your insights and get your details metrics out of it. Of course, create alarms from uh, from all the things that you see are going wrong. And uh, I would suggest creating alarms as you go, especially with data pipeline, because the data that comes in tends to be very versatile. And there are a lot of different cases that you eventually will cover with your alarms, but you can think of them all right away. And well, be free to experiment with the information you collect because that's the best part, because basically the task of building data pipeline is building a resilient and stable way of delivering the data. And basically everything that goes wrong and doesn't go according to, to plan is a place for you to investigate and a place for you to kind of research and, and learn. Uh, so collect as much information as you can, as much information as the, the CloudWatch cloud budget you have allows you uh, to and can utilize it uh, and utilize it actively. And this is just, I'm honestly, I'm so in love with logs, the log insight and with CloudWatch. Uh, just this is a simple example of what you can do. Simple example of a query that you can get. It's not even aggregation, it's just reading the, the, uh, the data. So the idea is that you basically can write a JSON object, uh, JSON coded uh, objects, either it's JavaScript, Python, or Go, or PHP. You can take some kind of dictionary and encode it in JSON and output it into a, a STD out. And let's say you can, you can always, for your events, add some kind of unique property which would identify those events as yours. For example, let's say event type or event or whatever. Um, and then you can actually filter just those from the logs because Lambda function actually writes a lot of logs and additional information that you can use. And yeah, you can filter only those events from the log group or the Lambda function that you find uh, you need to research and you can just get the list. Of course, you can do aggregations, you can write additional properties, you can kind of group by and counts and average and uh, do additional statistical stuff. But this is kind of the, the basic and it's kind of really cheap. Uh, coming to that one quote, 90% of the data you collect will never be actionable or even helpful. And unfortunately, this is true. And for the task of data pipeline, that's, that's even kind of painful, especially when you develop a good tool, a good data pipeline, and it delivers, delivers the data, but the 90% of the workload isn't actually useful. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it's a pain, right? But with a good design, with uh, versatile enough tooling, you can actually take those 10%, deliver them where they need to be, and the rest of the 90% you can kind of put away somewhere in your data storage, which you've chosen, which you've connected to your data pipeline and you can put it there and maybe someday this data will actually be helpful for you and for your businesses. So thank you. That is it for me, uh, for me for today. So I guess you can now ask questions and uh, we can dis discuss things. Uh, here is one question asked by Anton. Uh, you, sh you should be able to see it. Uh, question is how you manage all those pipelines, how everything connected and how you see whole pipe from start to the end. Uh, it, it actually depends on what you want to see and for what purpose. So uh, we actually, if you, you're talking about the visibility and the architecture overall, then we simply maintain documentation of what we do with the Lambda functions and the event delivery. So basically there is a whole set of documentation where you can, which you can open and it's actually connected to our uh, kind of infrastructure management tools. And uh, you can actually open and see the pictures where the data goes and uh, how the data is transformed on high, on very high level so that pipeline developers can actually see what's going on and can reason about it. And if they are kind of interested in what's going on in details, then you can then then they can go in into kind of deeper into the codes and investigate further and kind of get what, what is happening on the on the lower level if there's a specific task. But I guess it can be automated. I, I know that AWS has a lot of tooling regarding automation and uh, kind of the overall design of what is happening. So I think it can be automated with AWS 
they have some kind of service. I've heard of it. I just don't remember the name. Mm -hmm. uh, AWS versus Azure. Um, unfortunately, I'm not that proficient in Azure, uh, but from what I have seen with the cloud services, the actually the tooling that uh, AWS and Azure provides is somewhat similar uh, in, in kind of, so I'm most certain that in Azure, again, maybe there are some experts uh, here uh, connected to us about Azure and work actually have, have worked with Azure, maybe can comment. I think the Azure as well can and most probably have, uh, sorry, has some kind of, let's say, simple queue service, which AWS has, it, it just called differently. I know for a fact, for example, that AWS has uh, a DynamoDB, which is no SQL database storage, which is kind of scalable. And the Google has, I think it's Firebase, right? And so uh, usually cloud providers, especially for those essential kind of uh, uh, general services, general tools, they have, they have those things. So I don't know, but most probably Azure has something, and most probably even we could we if you look if you look close enough, you can find the exact tooling. Okay, uh, right now there are no more questions. I see that people start to leave. Uh, so I'm not sure how many can we expect uh, new questions. I uh, I suggest that let's wait for couple of minutes if, 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 if no questions appear. So, and, and you are at Slack, right? At DevClub Slack. Yeah, I am. I haven't opened it, but I am at Slack. Let me just stop sharing my screen and open the Slack. So if, if anybody wants to ask you a question and after stream, then uh, it's possible to catch you up at DevClub Slack. Yeah, sure. Feel free to write me. You can actually write me in Slack. Uh, in DevClub Slack, you can find me uh, in Twitter, in LinkedIn, basically everywhere. I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Especially if you play, uh, if you play Elder Scroll Online, and that's the important bit from the presentation. Seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there is one more. Uh, so one question: Why you selected spec uh, specifically AVS? Um. Actually, the, the answer will be very banal and won't be interesting at all. It, it's because we had some expertise with, with AWS and we had uh, just experts and develop, develop developers on premise and they kind of knew AWS. So basically we had the, the, the force to do something with AWS and the expertise with, with other services like Azure and Google we didn't have. And that's, that's basically it, at least at the time. Okay, uh, no more questions right now. Let's let's still wait for a moment. Okay. Maybe something will appear. Uh. I can't come up with any question by myself. I don't know why. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, yeah, it's it's evening already, late evening. I mean, it's, it's it's time to go and drink beer and watch TV. I guess it's a isolation and all that. Yeah. Uh, okay, I guess there will be no more questions right now. Then uh, thank you very much for 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 talk. Uh, <laughs> Having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for 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 hard work to prepare it and uh, make it and uh, hopefully to see you soon in uh, some on site dev club. Yeah, I, I actually really hope that we'll be having that relatively soon. It's kind of it's yeah. time already. I mean, we'll see. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you and uh, good night.